The Who, and it became the mod band, the high priest of rock and roll outrage, wrecking hotel rooms and instruments on stage with equal vigor. Alongside the destruction came a significant contribution to music, not simply the inevitable hit singles, but more significantly, two rock operas, Tommy and Quadrophenia, both written by my next guest. Ladies and gentlemen, Pete Townsend. <laughs> Fancy footwork. <clears throat> I'm not going to. Uh, uh, he's not the one who was engaged to Princess Margaret, is he? No. <laughs> no, 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 no. Princess Margaret. Princess Margaret turned him down, and this is why he got angry and smashed up all the guitars on stage. Oh, I see. <laughs> I'm not going to ask you actually about uh, music being in your family, because in fact, in the band there, we've got your dad. And there he is. And there's the dad. Yeah. <laughs> In fact, at the end of, of your spot, you're going to play for the first time ever in public with the old man. Hmm? True, yes. Did he teach you when you were a kid? Well, Dad played the guitar before the saxophone, so he knew a bit about it and he taught me a few chords mm -hmm. and got me started. And you, I mean, the, you are the only rock band, aren't you, to survive intact since the Who since said the I'm intact? Uh, the band is intact, <laughs> fairly intact. Why, why would that be, do you think? Why is it that you... Uh, this appeal. I don't know. I think in, in, intense passion about what we do. I know on the surface rock music all seems very trivial uh, medium, but in fact it, it contains always a, 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 a passion to communicate ideas and feelings and most of all care. I know it's a corny thing to say, but that's what lies behind it. And for us, strangely enough, I think why we've we've applied the same principles to the way we deal with one another, and uh, thus we 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 tend to bring our feelings out in the open. We have rows, we have fights, we have great times, we have good times, bad times, etc. But we get we get the discussions and the debates over with quickly. Nothing is bottled up, and I think that way you do tend to. I don't know, you get close to one another. But, but uh, in the relationship between you and the audience, Pete, I mean, uh, aren't you inevitably distanced from them uh, by just being what you are now, the super group? I mean, there, was a, there were days when you were in among, you represented the kids, but now you no longer do. I mean, you're at this superstardom and they're down there. <clears throat> everybody, everybody, I mean, if you go, if in the, in, the, in the States, and it's the same in Britain, everybody is in a group. Everybody plays the guitar. If they're not in a group, they've tried it. The, 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 the boy who hasn't had a crack at it, and now the girls who are, <laughs> haven't had a crack at it, are few and far between. And uh, so, obviously, only a few can make it. So, in a sense, when you play at a really great rock concert, you're just... Everybody's in the band and you're in the audience. The whole purpose of a, a great rock concert is to get past that. Mm. That's, that's the purpose of, 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 of a good rock concert. It's to, so everybody equalises, everybody forgets themselves, everybody forgets their egos and their problems. They go out and they have a great time, they go crazy, and if, if it's a good show, I forget who I am as well. I just feel like one in the crowd. What about the, the thing that The Who did, of course? I mean, they, they changed rock music in more ways than one. I mean, they changed it from one point of view, which is what happened on stage, where you had all the destruction, where Keith used to kick the drums over, you used to bash the guitar to pieces, the sound equipment used to be wrecked. Why was that? It was uh, musical frustration. It was... Uh, I don't know, you know, occasionally it happens now, I'll be halfway through a solo and I'll be playing really well and sail off a bit and then suddenly the fingers will not do what I want them to do and I f it makes me angry. And I think because rock stars are encouraged to behave as badly and just to be as obnoxious as possible, uh, let me put it another way. I can play what I think is a wonderful guitar solo and I actually feel very proud of it, and you get this sort of slow hand clap at the end. But if I take the guitar and smash it on the ground, it brings the house down. So it began as... It, it began as... Hey, if you scratch me more, mate, you'll be put to bloody bed. <laughs> <laughs> Just a, a wee bit of parental advice there. <laughs> and you won't get no tea. No, you won't get no tea. Eat your tea. And we'll keep putting it in front of you until you eat it. Yeah. 
but I mean, does that represent your dad's point of view about, about uh, the outrage you create on stage? I mean, have you had discussions with him about it, about the image and all that sort of thing? Well, if you look closely at his saxophone, you'll see that it's very badly bent. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I was just in, in uh, Berlin doing a film where they had a lot of punk rock uh, uh, concerts and I went to them. Now I realize that I know who you are, the who. I've got it all straight. You are not that man a long time ago that they wouldn't let Peter, they wouldn't let Margaret marry. But she knows another musician now. Oh. I better get off this stuff. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. This is, You're uh, in, I better get off. And punk. Yes. Yeah. Now wait. <clears throat> and Berlin. And uh, the, uh, I saw uh, some uh, saw uh, uh, the plasmatics in New York. Saw a car and a half on yeah. the stage. <laughs> and 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 the uh, kids and uh, I tried to talk to Blondie. I do know something about what. Now everything's falling into place. Um, and I tried to find out why this destruction. And and your, what year did you start your destruction about? Tell me in the sixties. Late yeah, 60s? 60, yes. Well, the near, whenever I could get them to talk to me, because I'm interested in doing a film about this, uh, uh, the punk rock world, um, directing and not being in it, uh, there seems to be some kind of frustration that comes. Don't laugh. <laughs> Just as uh, of you in a punk movie, that's all. <clears throat> uh, there is, you know, when the, you see them destroy the scenery, or they, they do very sexual things, like with scissors cutting scenery, and I mean, girl uh, punk rock stars. And uh, it seems to me that what I got out of them is that they get day by day in the newspapers the atom bomb. Is might fall, or, or the uh, the water's polluted, or this fight between communism and capitalism. Uh, love it, love of the it. world. Love but, it. But they say the uh, they say they don't love it. They say that's why the destruction. That it's a way of saying uh, a, a plague on both your houses. I don't think the Plasmatics are a serious rock band. They're a tremendously theatrical band, and I think that the the the, the girl was a stripper, wasn't she? The girl that sings in the Plasmatics. She used to be a Blondie? stripper. What about Blondie? Blondie, now that's a different thing. I mean, I would say that they are simply a pop band. Mm. Uh, whether or not they would agree with me, I mean, if you put Debbie and Chris Steiner, boyfriend, on your show, you'll probably find that they're incredibly serious and mm. intense about what they do. Probably as intense as, as I am, but I think the finest rock bands are people that have changed people's lives. But, but, but then that, I was going to uh, ask you that, because it seems to me that there's too many, there's too much high-flown, highfalutin argument and theorising put forward about popular music. Oh, well, shut case. up then. No, 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 no. <laughs> but I, I therefore want to ask you, I mean, in, how did you change anybody's life? In what way? I can't show you the letters because I haven't brought them with no, me. I'm only repeating really what people have told me. Really? I think by applying a complete, total dedication to people. But don't you think you release the audience's frustration and anger? They I take part of your... they get involved in... Yeah, but in... through what you write as well. The important thing for me, obviously, is apart from being the guitar player in the band, I write the songs and... Uh, I think that's important. It, it's an important. It's, it, it makes my position slightly different because I feel a direct communication with people, mm. and, and, I, and, and I, in fact, do get indirect communication with people who write. Sometimes very, very young kids. Sometimes people not so young. It doesn't really matter. I mean, people that communicate and say, "Listen, I heard the album. Such and such a song touched me very deeply. I was going through a particular thing, say with my dad, or my boyfriend left me, or I went through a drug problem, or I wasn't doing well at school, and this song helped me." Mm. So, you know, I'm. But th yeah. that's so. true for almost everything, isn't it? That if somebody will, somebody writes to you and says. Because I heard this, I now know that I'm not the only person who has ever been through this experience, which feels 20 well, times better straight knitting. off. See, I don't... Knitting. Knitting. Knitting, it's you, terrible. You are, you you don't don't feel knitting. Your knitting that. song helped me through a very <laughs> difficult... <laughs> Listen, I, I know you're musicians, and music is, is sort of the uh, something of our time, and our times are very violent. I don't know why. It's, I just came from Los Angeles. I wasn't going to talk about this, but I live next door to the Dakota, and I heard the shots that killed John Lennon, and Oof. they were afraid, they were, and I called the police. And, and I, I thought it was a backfire, and then I said... You're not going to stop crying again? No, I'm not going to. I think I'm not going to. <laughs> I wasn't going to talk about it. 
But we are living in very violent times, especially in Los Angeles. You know, people have got mace and guns and, and uh, they're scared to walk in the street. And uh, there's such ang And it seems to me that music, all art, does reflect its times and its uh, yeah, I, I don't think it changes. I think it reflects. I think that's absolutely right. I think that's and that's isn't the right. music now the punk rock expression of... Uh, I mean, like, I, two years ago, I was hearing I, there was somebody dressed like Hitler playing the piano on the BBC. But, I, but I don't think you see... Sparks! He's talking about sparks. I, I, I take... he, was, he was born looking like Hitler, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> Can we... What, what about the, um, the business there? You mentioned about kids would write into you with uh, problems about drugs and all that sort of thing. Now, there are casualties in, in, the, in the rock world, as there are indeed in, in the world of, <laughs> of uh, movies, where people... Yeah, there's a casualty here, the wrong barber, mate. <laughs> <laughs> Calm your hair, he said. I mean, Who you're... do you go to? Well, no, I don't. <laughs> so, um... It's cute. But I mean, what about what about the the, the drug thing and the and the self destruction that are people? I mean, you had the classic example in your group with Keith Moon. I mean, who drank himself and drugged himself to death. He, he? he decided to do it. It was amazing to watch. He was, he was a wonderful guy, but mm. he did have a black side as well. And the black side, if it wasn't applied to the outside world, he tended to concentrate on himself. He was an incredible, charismatic, funny guy who would just his whole life was. Who's, who's the straight man? Find the straight man, and then just rap and joke, and then on the stage, and he did, like the, 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 he totally dedicated to entertaining people. And <clears throat> my, uh, I think the, the expression I found, which I think summed him up the best, was is that if he thought it would get a laugh or make people happy, he would pour petrol over himself and set light to himself. He was that much of a showman. And I think in the end, funnily enough, at the point at which he died, he was at his most poised and contented. And I think there's something about being in the public eye and wanting people to love you all the time and wanting to pe people to, to respond to you and to respond to the things that you do and say and think, uh, that when you lose that and you suddenly wake up one day and you think, hold on a minute, I don't care anymore whether people laugh at me or I don't care whether they clap. I'm, I think that's what happened to Keith and I think then he just let go and, mm. and well, he'd had serious drug overdoses before but he'd never died mm. and the, the drugs that killed him uh, had, uh, I don't know, it's like, he, you know, he died peacefully in his sleep. That's the feeling I get, seriously. Mm. You know, even though it was drugs that affected it, I think he just let go. What about you, though, you yourself? I mean, were you ever on that, that really rocking the I'd same never, road? I've never been into narcotics. By that, I mean heroin and cocaine and things like that. I, uh, as the rock business is full of it, and it's a, sometimes it's a temptation when you're feeling really bad or really tired <coughs> to accept something that somebody offers you because you think it might get you through the night. But, uh... My drug experiences were really at art school. I went to art school, I was there at 16 years old. I was only there for three years because uh, I was playing guitar with the band then. And, <coughs> and the, guy, the guy that was the head of the graphics course that I was in said to me one day, he said, you, you play guitar in a group, don't you? I said, yeah. He said, how much do you earn? So I said, oh, about 30 quid a week. He said, 30 quid a week? Leave! <laughs> That's more than I earn, you know. And he was one of the guys, this is in 66 or, six, no, 62. Making uh, the, the big Guinness, the famous Guinness commercials and, and stuff like that. Really good, you know, wonderful agency. I can't remember the name. Mm. And uh, what was the question again? No, I was asking you about your own experiences with drugs. Actually. Yeah, and I, I, I went into it quite naturally there, pot smoking uh, at art school in that kind of culture was quite a common thing and it was also common in the area on which I lived. Mm. There were some big pushers operating in the area where I grew up and it was just there but I, in 67 I decided to stop and I stopped doing anything can and I... became an alcoholic. And became an alcoholic <laughs> instead. <laughs> Well, I mean, can you name me a musician who isn't, for God's sake? I mean, all that lot over there. I mean, really. Um... <laughs> but what about, what about the, the thing that actually gave you, you're talking there about money, that gave you financial liberation? Because you weren't, in spite of what all the speculation, weren't a, a rich group at all until you did Tommy. I think I'd be right in saying that. That's true, yeah. That was the one that really 
cracked it for you. What, what gave you the idea of writing the first time, for the first time a rock opera? Well, such? in Britain, I'll give you a bit of history. The Who were a big singles band. We used to put out a single about once a week. We had, I think, 12 hits. We were never a number one act, The Who. There was a slight sort of subculture thing going on with The Who. But we had hits, you know, we, we, the f first record we made was a hit, Can't Explain, Any Way, Any How, Anywhere, My Generation, Substitute, I'm a Boy, Pictures of Lily, straight up they went. Finally, I wrote the song which uh, I felt was one of the best songs I'd ever written. It was called I Can See for Miles. Mm. And it was quite a fiery Wagnerian piece, but I, I spent a lot of time working on the vocal harmonies and structuring it. We put it out, it didn't sell a copy. And I was humiliated. And I thought, well, you know, what am I going to do? What, what, what do the Who do? You know, we've, and then we put out another couple of strange records, one about dog racing called Dogs, because I used to like to go to White City and have a flatter. <laughs> but uh, so I thought, this is it. I'm going to have a last ditch attempt. Like Keith, you know, if they want me to pour petrol over myself and set myself alight, let's go for broke. So I thought, something really pompous, crazy, ridiculous. A rock opera <laughs> about a deaf, dumb and blind boy <laughs> who gets given drugs by an acid queen, raped by his own uncle, uh, you know, and, and so on and so forth. And, the rest and then history. becomes the Messiah! <laughs> That'll make money. And did and, it ever. Well, what happened is I got about halfway through it and I actually really got very serious about it and it became one of my most focused pieces of writing because I was using the singles medium. In other words, each segment of the piece was like a short single, nothing more than two or three minutes long. Not like your bloody things. <laughs> <laughs> Go on for hours. <laughs> Thank you. She said, I was waiting back there for you to finish. <laughs> no, I was waiting out here. But what about, <laughs> finally, 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 can I ask you, I mean, you're, you're what, 36 now, and you're on the road, you're in the... You're 36 doing, in May. 36 in May, and you're 19th. Doing, doing a tour. It can't go any easier, all the touring. Do you intend to go on doing it, or what? Uh, I'm not sure. I'm questioning at the moment. I'm very worried about pushing it too hard. I, you know, the trouble is with rock is, is you know, Shelley was talking about the... the, the, the the, what you expect of a, 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 a growing, aging actress who was once, dare I say, exquisitely beautiful, still tremendously attractive. <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> it's, it's you, isn't it? That, I'm not 22 it... anymore. <laughs> well, neither I know am that. I, love. And it, you do think about it too much. Yeah. You know, if you're a bank clerk or something, I don't think it worries you as much. Everybody's worried about age. The thing is, is that you have to try to grow up with dignity, and that's very difficult in the rock business. Mm. So I am thinking about it. Well, fine. All right, then. Well, you're going to, in fact, um, do us another uh, first in your musical career tonight. As I say, you're going to play now with Cliff, your dad. Grow up Are with you? dignity. This is... Yes, well, <laughs> before you go there, could I thank Richard Stilgo and Shelley Winters for, for being my guests? And, uh, Pete, we leave the floor now to you and your dad. All right? Right. Pete Townsend, thank you very much. Pete Townsend.